Hello everyone, my name is Pat Donahue. I'm a criminal defense attorney based out of Spokane, Washington, and uh, I'm the one where I'm a criminal defense attorney based out of Spokane, Washington, and I'm the one uh, I'm the one working with ADAPT here to get this legislation together. I was gonna say before before you congratulate me though, I want to make it abundantly clear: everything that um, I'm working on, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, this this isn't anything that that I created out of my own doing. Um, there's a lot of work done in Oregon, and there's been a lot of work done for the past 35 years to overturn 50 years of bad and, and quite frankly, very dangerous drug policy. And so where I'm at is just merely standing on the shoulders of giants, and I'm, I'm standing with you all, and I'm proud and honored to be here. I was thinking about my presentation on the way here, and I realized I, I don't like the title, Oregon versus Washington. Um, it must be my legal training that kind of got me, got me in that mindset. I don't like it because it's, it's, it strikes me as competitive, but I'm, I'm stuck with it. Uh, so my presentation here today is, is the key differences between the two approaches that we're taking here. Um, so big picture here. Here in Washington State, we're following in the footsteps of Oregon's 109. Uh, Oregon had two voter initiatives that passed, 109 and 110. 110 decriminalized possession of not all but a handful of drugs. And 109 created a legal framework for adult psilocybin services. Uh, this is separate from decriminalization. Decriminalization merely removes criminal penalties, um, in this case for possession of the substance. Uh, what Oregon's 109 did is it, it created uh, a robust regulatory framework where a consumer can go into a store and purchase psilocybin and it ex have a psilocybin experience. As we move forward here today, again, we're, we're standing not on the shoulders of 109, but we also, I think it's important for us to learn the lessons from cannabis. As Patrick spoke at the very beginning of today, um, I thought he was wise to point out the history there. Um, we've come a long way, again, thanks to the work of a lot of great organizations, Normal comes to mind, but many others. Um, and as we move forward with psilocybin, not every step we make is gonna be the correct one, but we can, we can learn some lessons um, from movements like cannabis. So a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll try to keep it to my 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about the licensing available to psilocybin service facilitators under Oregon law. That's 109. I'm going to talk about proposed Washington psilocybin facilitator licenses. I'm going to discuss briefly the reasoning behind our approach and then moving forward and how our, our efforts here will hopefully result in continued forward progress and not just one step forward and then a stationary sort of situation. With Oregon 109, so Oregon 109, if you uh, are in, uh, Oregon 109 is undergoing a rulemaking process right now, um, basically to establish the, the who, what, when, where, and how this is gonna be done and how this medicine is gonna be provided to people. Uh, I have up here the, the requirements under Oregon 109 uh, to become a psilocybin service facilitator. This is a, a, a trip sitter, kind of in, in uh, language more common to us. Um, one thing that's really cool about Oregon 109, two, well, a lot of things are really cool about it, but two things I'd like to emphasize now. One, an individual does not need a diagnosis to go into a psilocybin service center and have a psychedelic experience. So this is open to, to any adult 21 and over. Additionally, in order to become a psilocybin service facilitator, you don't need any advanced degrees. You don't need to be a doc. Um, and uh, the requirements to become a psilocybin service facilitator in Oregon, you need to be 21 years of age or older. Until 2025, you have to have been a resident of Oregon for two or more years. And in terms of educational requirements, it's a GED or high school diploma, that's it. Um, I think I think personally that's great. Now, there is in addition to these minimal requirements to become a psilocybin service provider in Oregon, and it's going to be similar here in Washington. You will have to take a, a state training. You will, you will have to pass a state course, and the um, Oregon psilocybin advisory panel actually just announced um, some of the requirements for that. It's going to be. I believe off the top of my head, it was 125 hours of classwork and then 40 hours of clinical work. 
and then you can sit for their examination, and there are going to be um, yearly things to keep your licenses out. But it's it's a commitment. It's 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 no joke. It's going to take a significant amount of time for individuals to be able to provide this medicine to people. Um, in Oregon, in addition to facilitator licenses, there are manufacturer licenses, and then there are service center licenses. I bring this up because there's a very important misconception that seems to be floating out there is, in Oregon, all consumption needs to be done at a service center. Um, this isn't a sort of thing like cannabis where you can go into a shop and you can, you can purchase psilocybin from a, a facilitator and go home and have your own experience. You need to be at a center and you need to be with a psilocybin service facilitator. This doesn't matter, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're taking what I, I, I describe as a microdose or a threshold dose. And sort of a, a brief description on the, the lingo I'm using there. Um, I consider a microdose to be a sub-threshold level dose. What's a threshold dose? <laughs> a threshold dose is kind of a, a medical term but this is the dose at which, um, and perhaps some folks are here are familiar with this, but you start to experience more of the subjective effects. Um, time, time dilation, synesthesia, visual hallucinations at higher doses, etc. Again, doesn't matter whether you're taking a microdose or a threshold dose, you have to be at the service center for the duration of the experience. There was, as of last week, a recommendation from the psilocybin advisory panel to the Oregon Health Authority that they allow microdose cafes. What those look like, we don't know. Whether or not the Oregon Health Authority is going to take the psilocybin advisory panel's recommendation and allow that, we also don't know. So there, there's a possibility of some microdosing um, in Oregon's law, but it is by no stretch of the imagination certain. It froze, not responding. Well, that's all right, we'll move on without it. So looking to Oregon, um, as we move forward here in Washington, ADAPT is gonna go forward with a slightly different model. And um, in terms of the facilitator licenses. So here in Washington, we are gonna have three levels of facilitator licenses. We're just gonna call them tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier three licenses are, will be available to anybody who completes the state level training and who has a high school diploma or GED. Excellent, there we go. Tier one, tier two, tier three. And because I'm going off a slide, I'm in reverse. Uh, so tier three psilocybin service facilitators, these will be anybody with a high school diploma or GED who passes the state level training. So you don't need advanced degrees to provide psilocybin services in Washington under this proposed piece of legislation. However, there's a slight difference in that we have tier one and tier two as well. Tier one psilocybin service providers, these are gonna be individuals licensed in the state of Washington as MDs, as registered nurse practitioners, as CRNAs. These are people who already under existing law prescribe controlled substances to people. In between that, we're going to have tier two psilocybin service providers. These are going to be individuals who have advanced degrees, perhaps masters in social work, perhaps they're chemical dependency experts. Um, these are therapists who aren't necessarily able to prescribe medication, but have a level of training um, sort of ab above and beyond just a, a, a GED, and I say just, but beyond the high school diploma or, or GED. All three of these classes of providers will be able to provide um, threshold doses to clients at psilocybin service centers. Why the tiered system? So the, there was some back and forth in Oregon about whether or not to go forward with the tiered system. They decided not to. In Washington, we're moving forward. Um, one, for more clarity for the consumer. Um, while a lot of people will be comfortable with a more traditional sort of trip sitter, the reality of the situation is a lot of people are going out there and they're looking for treatment and diagnosis of medical conditions. And without clarity in the licensing system, an individual may be seeking out sort of a doctor level or more white coat level experience and wind up with someone who, who doesn't have those credentials. 
And it could possibly be confusing and I think also potentially dangerous for an individual who, again, might be seeking treatment or diagnosis of medical conditions and winds up with someone who's really unable to do that. Additionally, it differentiates more between a, a adult use. So if you're just looking for a casual experience um, or you're more um, familiar with these molecules, you'll be able to more easily differentiate what, what you do and don't need. Another thing that this will allow, microdoses. Microdoses, microdoses, microdoses. So a big step forward that we're taking here in Washington is we are gonna allow tier one service providers to provide clients with microdoses. These are sub-threshold take-home microdoses that do not need to be consumed on site. This is, I think, a big step forward and I think a responsible step forward. There are a lot of headlines out there and there's a lot of information showing the helpfulness and the efficacy of microdoses and how these can help people suffering brothers and sisters live their daily lives. And they won't be stuck to the confines of a um, perhaps a microdose cafe or some sort of more clinical setting. Um, they'll be able to actually take these with them out into the world and, and resume a more normal life. Now, there are requirements um, in Oregon. The, the framework for a threshold level experience in Oregon is going to be, we're going to mirror that here in Washington. And, and in Oregon, to have a threshold level experience, there's basically three steps. There's a preparation session where you meet with the provider and the provider screens out for contraindications to make sure the individual is a good candidate for psilocybin assisted therapy. Following the preparation session, if the, the individual uh, goes forward and the provider elects to proceed, there's the, the actual, what I would describe as a ceremony, but experience itself, again, located and, and strictly restricted to the confines of a psilocybin service center. For the threshold dose, there is, after that, and there has to be offered an integration session. Now, the client doesn't have to follow up on the integration session. It's at the client's discretion whether or not they take it, but it has to be offered. Here in Washington, there's going to be a separate uh, and kind of similar system for microdoses. For microdoses, there's going to be a specific microdose preparation center where the, where the client meets with the provider, the provider discusses the risks, the benefits, the dangers potentially of microdoses and, and how to responsibly use these and um, screens, the, screens the client to make sure that they're an appropriate candidate for microdoses. A subtle difference here is if the client is ultimately given the microdoses, there will be a mandatory follow-up session. The client's going to have to go back to the provider and the provider is going to at that point be able to check in one, is this working for the client? Does the client need the dosage adjusted? And quite frankly, is the client using this molecule responsibly? Now, with any piece of legislation, there's gonna be a lot of compromises. Um, my personal opinion is decided it would be wonderful if anybody, in my opinion, could just grow this in their own closet and provide the medicine freely and as they deem responsibly fit. But the reality of the situation is, especially east of the Cascades, a lot of people don't know what this stuff is. A lot of people are really scared. And there's the possibility that because of that, they're going to vote no. With this model system, we can emphasize that the people who are providing these microdoses out in the wild, if you will, are people who are already prescribing controlled medication. And they're going to be prescribing these medications, or they're going to be providing the psilocybin uh, based upon a similar model. Again, advantages to the Washington approach. We believe that this strikes a good balance of pushing the needle forward, of, of allowing responsible adult use of psilocybin microdoses off premise where you're not necessarily monitored constantly, while balancing the concern the public's going to have, potentially with allowing someone with um, no medical training to be prescribing drugs that are released out in the wild. Another key difference though it is, or another important component of this bill is, how do we prevent this from just being stacked? Um, and in other words, the microdose capability being just um, sort of protected by the tier one providers. And to combat that, we're creating what we're calling the psilocybin microdose advisory board. Now, this board is specifically tasked with making recommendations to the Department of Health on the topic of microdoses. And more specifically, 
Um, they're directed to help the Department of Health expand off-premise microdose powers to tier two and tier three psilocybin providers. What those rules look like, I don't know. Um, however, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to believe that there's gonna be some sort of regulation in place before people are just allowed to kind of give these out to whoever they want. And um, we'll see what the future holds. At this point, this kind of seems in, in our analysis to be the, the safe way to, again, push this needle forward in a responsible way without um, scaring so many people to, to vote no. The big picture here, again, while, while I believe in this medicine and I've seen the benefits that this medicine can have for people, we, we want to get it in the hands of our suffering brothers and sisters as quickly as possible without pulling a Timothy Leary and without ripping the rug out from underneath another two generations and setting this movement back. So while it's partially frustrating to not be able to take all these steps that we'd like to take in one big leap, um, in our analysis, this is a, a prudent way for us to move forward and keep pushing this needle forward and to get this medicine again into the hands of our suffering brothers and sisters who need it the most. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out here tonight. I'd like to thank you for your generosity in supporting this event and supporting the silent auction. And I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much.